you know, thank you everyone for, for having me. My name is John Vucetich. Uh, pronunciation was perfect. So th thanks for that. Um, it's a hard name, of course, for some folks. Um, I'm a professor at Michigan Technological University. I've studied wolves for all of my adult life, many aspects of wolves, their ecology, policy, human dimensions of wolf-human relationships. Um, and I've done it in, in many places throughout the world. And so, well, anyways, that's the, the background with which I, I come to you all. Um, so I've, I've just entitled this some thoughts on uh, the relationship between wolves and their prey, because I think my thoughts are a little bit um, idiosyncratic, um, just in terms of how they're organized, because I, I tried to, to pick the things that I think are the, the what I think might be the most important uh, for you all. And so with that, we'll just we'll dive straight into things. First, a little bit of jargon and a little bit of framing. Um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about a couple of terms that I use, and also just a little bit about how scientists tend to think about this particular problem. Um, and so starting off super simple, imagine you have an ecosystem, and there is what we would refer to these as these different trophic levels, so vegetation down at the bottom, uh, it gets eaten by, let's say, deer and elk, and uh, those are the herbivores, and then some predators at the top, we can just say wolves and cougars, and uh, so this makes a, a, a kind of a food chain, if you like, it's possible that the way the system works, and this only has to be a possibility, that's all, is that there are uh, what are referred to as, as bottom-up influences. And a bottom-up influence might be interpreted in this way. It's basically the, the deer and the elk eating little enough of the vegetation. So that doesn't really impact the vegetation but supports the deer and the elk. And so one of the things that means is that if there's more vegetation, there'd be more deer and elk. If you, if you don't mind, the, the, it's a slight metaphor here, I think. Imagine the deer and elk in this case, they're living off the interest rate of a bank account when the bank account is a vegetation. But it's possible for it to be the other way around too, where there are what is referred to as top-down influences. Um, and here the, the bank account uh, metaphor continues to work. In this case, the deer and the elk will be eating into the principle. And so the more deer and elk there would be, there would be less vegetation. And so those top down influences and those bottom up influences, they can not only occur between herbivores and the vegetation, but they can also occur between predators and the prey. And the way I've got this drawn here, this is just the possibility that they could go like this. It's possible if you don't mind my making use of the icons. The bottom-up influences, the green influences could be relatively small in a particular ecosystem and the top-down influences could be relatively big or it could be the other way around that the bottom-up influences are large and the top-down influences are small. And they don't even have to be consistent that any of those arrows could be any size. And so one of the things that scientists have tried to do is try to understand how is it the ecosystems behave in terms of those arrows, which ones are the big ones and which ones are the small ones. And the phrase that I'll use um, somewhat repeatedly in the next few minutes, are top-down and bottom-up influences, and that's what I'm referring to. Again, if it's a bottom-up influence of the consumer, whoever's doing the eating is living off the interest, it's a top-down influence. Think of the consumer, whoever's doing the eating, a predator or an herbivore, as those are that they're eating into the principle, if you will, and therefore are going to depress abundance. So that's the basic framing, and now I'll take you to a place that I have uh, spent a large portion of my life studying, which is uh, in Lake Superior, there is a, an island, Isle Royal National Park. It's uh, the site of the world's longest study of any predator prey system in the world. And uh, I've, I led it for, I don't know, 20 or 25 years and still, still deeply involved with it. And what I wanna share with you about this study is not only what I think is probably most pertinent to you, to your group, um, but also what I think is actually the most important result to come from the study for without any other kind of uh, qualification, really. So the centerpiece of the work that we've done is, um, is to count the number of wolves and moose each year for a very long time. And the project started in 1959, goes up to the present day. This graph doesn't go quite to the present day just because I haven't taken the time to, to update it, but there's, there's nothing that's happened in the last few years that's... Uh, isn't well captured but by what I'm about to show you. One of the things we've always been interested in as scientists is to understand why those fluctuations occur the way they do. Why are there sometimes more wolves and sometimes more moose? And I should see 
I noticed there's a part of the graph that's not labeled here. So the, um, the black circles, those are the moose and the open circles, uh, those are uh, the wolves. And so one of the things that uh, we had noticed shortly after it occurred was there's this really important disease that had struck the wolf population, um, caused the wolf population to, to collapse over a two year period. And it's not just that it collapsed dramatically and over a short period of time, but it did occur to us at the time and boy, the, the dynamics between wolves and moose didn't really quite seem the same. They seemed a little bit different after that disease had come around and we couldn't really quite put our finger on it, but just didn't seem to be quite the same. The other thing that really struck us in kind of an important way is in 1996, there was a really extreme winter, severe, severe winter, and uh, that led to a crash in the moose population. Again, it also struck us that after that extreme winter event, things, you know, that seemed to be different for many, many years afterwards than what they had been, been prior to that. A few other things that have happened, and I'll, I'll kind of gloss over the nature of the events because they're, they're actually not as important as what comes next. There was a genetic rescue event that occurred right here. Um, a wolf came from the mainland to Isle Royal, infused the wolf population with some new genetic material, kind of gave a boost to the wolf population. Um, and then um, what happened a little while later is that the, the disease, that thing that I call the novel disease, it had disappeared, but then it came back and it came back in that particular year that I've kind of highlighted here. Turns out also kind of coincidentally, right around the same time, that inbreeding depression in the wolf population had resumed. And so that genetic rescue that had kind of helped the wolves out, those beneficial effects had worn out by about that time. And one of the things that, uh, that occurred to us, and, and it's kind of important to appreciate that it occurred to us kind of organically and just as we were thinking about how these unfold, things unfolded one year at a time, is, is that the system seemed like it behaved differently in each of these four periods and each of these four periods were marked by these events. They were events that you couldn't really predict or know what their impacts would be. And one of the things that we eventually figured out for how it is that we could characterize the difference between these different periods of time is through a statistic that's known as the predation rate. Now the value of the predation rate is a kind of information providing idea differs depending on what kind of ecosystem you're in. On Isle Royal, predation rate is super insightful. It tells a ton. It's basically a cause specific mortality rate. It's a mortality rate due to predators. And on Isle Royal, predators are the, the primary cause of mortality. So a big part of what's happening to the moose population can be expressed through this thing called the predation rate. And it just occurred to us to just ask, what is the predation rate for each of these four periods of time? And in that first block of time, the average predation rate was about 12%, which is pretty high. The next period of time, it was about 6%, relatively speaking in how fairly low, half as high on average. The next period of time, it was really quite high, 14% on average. And then this most recent period, only about 2%. And so these different levels of predation rate, they, for Isle Royal at least, are really useful indicators of whether the system is um, being exposed to strong top-down or bottom-up influences. And so basically, for in the very beginning, for the first about 20 or so years of the study, there was a strong top-down influence of wolves for the next almost 20 years, there was not strong top-down bottom, a strong top-down influence, but really a strong bottom-up influence. You know, for about the next 15 years or so, it reversed. And then most recently, it's reversed again. And so the, I have only, I think only two lessons, maybe three, depending on how you count them. This is the first lesson, which is that in any one place, the relative balance of top-down and bottom-up influences are likely to vary over time. While we discovered that on Isle Royal, and Isle Royal is a relatively a particular place, there's only a single predator, only a single prey, there's no human hunting going on of the moose or the wolves. Um, so it's special in a lot of ways, but I, I kind of think this is liable to be a conclusion that the, probably plays out in a lot of places. Um, move on to the second lesson. Second lesson has to do with some things that happened in Yellowstone. I'm pretty sure that I can do this without stealing the a good that Matt is going to tell you and Arthur are going to tell you about in a little bit because I think they'll tell you about Yellowstone too. Um, this is a map just to show you roughly where we're talking about. Northern part of Wyoming, southern part of Montana, the Yellowstone Range, which is where the Yellowstone uh, elk herd, the northern range of the Yellowstone elk herd, where it is that they overwinter. 
And uh, one of the things that happened is that uh, in the 80s and early 90s, elk were very abundant in that place. Wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Elk abundance declined by about 50% over the next decade. Hunters and managers insisted uh, that wolves were the cause of that decline. And so one of the, and then if you look at a, a graph like this, um, the blue line shows what the elk were up to. And the arrow shows where it is and when it is, I should say that wolves were introduced. And so if you just look at the graph like, like oh, geez, it looks pretty straight, bring wolves in, elk population declines. It's, I mean, the cause and effect would seem pretty straightforward and simple. Um, one of the things that I did was take an interest in just this exact relationship. And the way that I took an interest in and now the next couple of slides are a little bit telegraphic and a tiny bit wonky. If you follow them, I think that's great. If you don't follow them, it's probably okay because I'm aiming for a take-home message that'll be pretty transparent. So anyways, maybe 60 seconds of, of just a little rough stuff here. What I did is I built a population model, a way of predicting, hindcasting, if you will, what that elk population would have done during that blue period before wolves got there based on data that was available throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So things like if you know how many elk there are, a lot of elk or not so many elk, that'll tell you something about how they might grow in the next year, increase or decrease in abundance. If you could know what the drought conditions were, lots of precipitation or not so much. If you can know what the hunting pressure is. So we had all that information and we built a model for that time period. And then what we said is if we take that model that we build from that blue period, we can project it forward into the green period, ignore wolves, pretend like they weren't there. And if the model that we build makes a good prediction with what actually happened, then what we did is we predicted what happened without having to take account of wolves which means that wolves may not have been the explanation for what's going on. And so point number three is what I said there just a moment ago. It turns out this is the prediction that comes from that process that I described. And that prediction in red matches pretty closely what happened. The basic finding is, now we need to kind of start paying attention to the finer details here, is that during that period marked by red, which is the same period when wolves were first brought back to Yellowstone, it turns out that human harvest on elk was elevated as compared to prior years. And it was, relatively speaking, a, a much drier period in a way that was probably not so good for the elk. And so drought and human harvest probably are the best explanation for this. If that's interesting, that's great. But it's actually not the most interesting part to me anyways. I published this work in about the year 2006. And it's for a period that covers, I don't know, like 1995 to like maybe 2004 or something like that. When this came out, this was considered to be fairly controversial because most people thought it was pretty straightforward that wolves had caused the decline. It took at least five years, maybe, maybe more like seven years for people to kind of come to appreciate that this is probably the best explanation for what occurred during this period of time. And this leads to what I think is the second most important lesson for this group, which is that with the best data, and let's just pause on that phrase, with the best data, Yellowstone is a place really almost singular in the world where you have more data than anyone else would ever have about the elk and the wolves, the other creatures that are doing their thing, the weather, really, you can't expect to have that much information in most places. But even with all of that information, one is unlikely to know the relative valence of top-down and bottom-up influences until long after the fact. And of course, it begs the question, why? And the, I think the reason why is, is, is reasonably straightforward, which is that prey abundance is simultaneously influenced not only by predation of, of wolves or cougars or predators, have, but also hunting, habitat quality, and, and, then, and then the weather as well. And because all those things are, in, are acting at the same time, it's, it's basically, it's just hard to, to figure out. And so scientists sometimes can figure it out, but typically not until a fair bit of time has passed after, after the fact. The, the next thing and the last thing that I wanna share very briefly is uh, what I think is the case is that the reason that you invited um, Arthur and Matt and myself to speak is not just a purely academic interest in why it is that and how it is that wolves affect their prey, but there's, I, I think there's a question that motivates it, which is a question that if it's not exactly like this, it might be something like this. Can wolf hunting improve hunter's satisfaction, satisfaction with elk hunting? 
turns out this would also be a science question, and it's a science question I know just a little bit about, and so I, I thought I would share a few, few thoughts about it. If the answer to that question is yes, then what would have to happen is kind of a chain of, of relationships that would start with, it might be decided to have wolf hunting, and then that wolf hunting would have some kind of effect on wolf abundance, like say to decrease wolf abundance. And then that decreased wolf abundance would have to have some kind of an effect on elk abundance, like increase elk abundance, which would have to have some kind of an effect on hunter success rate, presumably increase it. And that might have some kind of an effect on hunter satisfaction, again, presumably to increase it. Now, every one of those arrows is a relationship that could be studied by science and tried to figure out if it really plays out the way that I suppose that it might. And we only looked at one of those relationships, which is that blue arrow, that top-down, bottom-up processes. And the main conclusion that I would like you to, to, to glean from that is that the answer to that question for most is going to be readily knowable. And so, but a few things can be said of those other arrows, and I'm a little bit, because of the short time that we have, just kind of glossing over the top here, but I think enough to kind of, um, if you're interested into it, you and your group can easily dig into the finer details. If you're interested in that green arrow, the basic question is this, is what harvest rate, which is like the percentage of wolves, would have to be killed to lead to, and I'm using the words kind of carefully here, effectively reduce the abundance, you know, like, you know, reduce them enough to make a difference on, on the wolf abundance and have an effect all the way down the causal chain there, but without overdoing it, because no, nobody wants to clobber the wolf population, presumably would want to just you know, reduce it a little bit. Anyways, that green box is another scientific question that's filled with about as, as much uncertainty as that blue box. And then this pink arrow, how it is that hunter success rate is related to elk abundance. The most important thing here is that hunter success rate depends on more than just elk abundance. There's other things going on. W one easy thing would be just the weather conditions that are occurring at that particular year as just an example. And it's also the case that hunter satisfaction depends on more than just the success rate of hunters. Hunters are sometimes satisfied with their hunting experience because of things that don't have to do with whether they were successful or not. And so here's my point. And this is a very scientific point about scientific decision-making is that scientific decision-making under this kind of empirical uncertainty and multi-causality, two things are going on here. There's uncertainty about how these relationships play out, and there's more than one factor at play, more than one causal agent going on at the same time. When you have those conditions, your decision-making usually depends on the normative, you can think of ethical, if you like that word better, ethical value of the possible actions and outcomes, and it depends on it in a pretty weighty way. And so what I'm trying to say is that one of the things that I know you know from the beginning is that questions about wolf hunting depends on values. And it also tends to make people want to look at the science in the hopes that the science can maybe clarify the values. I don't know that it works that way. I think in this case, while the science is important and important to understand in a sophisticated way, the science is a confirmation that a lot of action over what counts as a good decision is going to rest uh, with how people adjudicate the values. I think in the interest of time, I, I'll leave it to the, to the moderator. I have maybe another 60 or 120 seconds more to say, but if my time is up, I could stop there. <laughs> I, I, I think we're good, John. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll adjourn then. Thank you so much. And I'll stop sharing my screen. No, did you, did you want to continue? Oh, I can. Oh, I, I misheard. I will continue. So sorry. What I want to do is I want to say a tiny bit more about that sentence about how it is that values interact with the science, because this is one of the hardest things about making decisions. We think we understand some science and we think we understand how that can help us make a decision. We think we understand how the values play out, but like, how do they work together a little bit? Because they usually do. They interact. And what I'm about to say next is um, is entirely for the purpose of illustration. And they're really just suppositions, mainly to help me make my point. They're not very realistic uh, in, in a certain set of ways. So here's the thing. Let's suppose that we had some values. One value, again, this is where I'm being kind of overly simple just to help me make my point. Let's suppose the value is that the moral cost of killing a wolf is nil. Basically, it doesn't matter. And let's also suppose that the positive moral value of hunter satisfaction is second to none, is super important. I know neither one of those cases is really the case, but if I say it that way, it makes me, it makes my point a little easier to make. If those were your values, then the decision 
even in the presence of all of that uncertainty is pretty easy, you would hunt wolves because it might increase hunter satisfaction and it done really because there really wasn't any cost. However, what if the moral costs of killing a wolf, and I'm, here I am using my words very carefully, what if the moral cost of killing a wolf is importantly greater than nil? How much more? I don't know, just importantly more. And what if the positive moral value of hunter satisfaction is importantly less than second to none? You know, I don't know how much less, but just you know, not the most important thing in the universe. The more that that's the case, those two green boxes, the more that those two green boxes are the case, then the less likely that blue decision way on the right is going to be sensible. How much less likely is it to be sensible? That's the very hard question to ask, and it depends very greatly on how the fine details of adjudicating the two values in the green box. And while you can importantly rely on a good understanding of the science to help you adjudicate those values, it will not relieve the heavy lifting, I don't believe, relieve the heavy lifting of having to work through those values. So anyway, so that's the place that I would wanna stop. And, um, and again, thank you so much for your attention. I think I went a tiny bit over my time um, and I, I thank you for that. <laughs>